Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the State of Minority Address. Um, it used to be State of Wrestling Address, but now just the foreigners. Nobody else wants to join us. Cameron Anderson is busy at Premier Promotions, uh, losing as per usual. Frankie T is busy with family issues. Silent Mark is, you know, Silent Mark. So you are left with the original host, of course, myself, Aaron Nix, the Egyptian Death Machine, and the man who puts wood in Bollywood, our brownest of all co-hosts, Tamvir Verdi, giving me a run for my money on the old skin zone. <laughs> Feel like a whopping great <laughs> olive next to you, Sunshine. Uh, as, a pl- as always, uh, a pleasure to be here, and I love always being in your company. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, mate. Um, bit of a slow news week again. Like, you know, since all out, all that drama and all that mm-hmm. stuff we've had, it's it's quieting down a bit. And obviously, it's the holiday season. We're in between Christmas and New Year now. So, you know, hopefully you guys have had a, a good time off. Happy holidays, whatever you uh, choose to celebrate or not celebrate. Um, but yeah, there are a few things to talk about just briefly. And then, of course, me and Tanvir will fill the gap by probably having a look at some lists and having a bit of a giggle. Yeah. Um, I want to start with something positive once because we always start with some bloody miserable. Rich Swan named his TNA Mount Rushmore. Oh, OK. I'm interested in this. I didn't see that. So, uh, I mean, the full article here, it's all, obviously all available on Wrestling Inc., which is normally where we go to for some news. Um, obviously, Rich won himself 200 day reign as an Impact World Champion, uh, winning the title from Eric Young at Bound for Glory in 2020 before dropping it to Kenny Omega. What a great <laughs> title run that was. <clears throat> for me, creating a TNA slash Impact Mount Rushmore is easy because there are the guys that definitely, especially when I was young and just started to get into pro wrestling as an athlete and everything like that. Um, I would say Sting for sure, Christian Cage. Uh, for sure, because he was definitely a big jump once he left WWE to come to TNA. Nobody thought that like, oh, wait a minute. What's he doing here? The whole star, the whole star on the thing and the video of his feet. That whole thing was awesome. Definitely AJ Styles said Swan um, and Samoa Joe. <clears throat> so Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, Christian Cage and Sting. Tanvir Verdi, who's yeah. Mount Rushmore for TNA slash Impact. So Rich Swan already said two of mine, which are guarantees, which are AJ Styles and Samoa Joe. I, I absolutely love Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe's up there in like my upper echelon of like greatest of all times for me. Yeah. Because for me, Samoa Joe was the king of like 2000s independent wrestling of like... The you, king of the X Division. <laughs> yeah. Um, next, I'd probably go with um, Alex Shelley. Because okay. Alex, Alex Shelley was kind of the guy who, who I think still now... A lot of people look to have like he's the innovator, he's the inspiration for like a generation. And I think final pick, it might be a little bit out there, but because he was at a time where I was kind of getting in and out of impact, Austin Aries. I'd say Austin Aries as wow. a shout. Because he because he did have he did have some pretty cool reigns and stuff, and he was a he was, he was innovative. Sweet. Yeah. So so that's why I was like for me, because I grew up around that time where it was like Austin Aries, Kurt Angle, Sting, um more. I, I want to throw an honourable mention just more so for the moment overall than as a wrestler. Elix Skipper. Oh, what? The old crack whore for the uh, for the uh, Hurricane Runners off the cage. I, I love it so much. Yeah, them, are them cage walks, yes. <laughs> Um Yeah, I think AJ Styles is a must. I think anyone who doesn't have AJ Styles on there is wrong yeah. um, because AJ Styles was the heart and soul of that company for the best part of 10 years. And on top of that, he was... You know, he was brought to light through TNA and Impact. He was always kind of like an incredible athlete, but nobody ever really yeah. knew about him until they watched TNA. And like, Holy shit, this guy. Um, Samoa Joe's on mine as well. Mm. Uh, the most dominating wrestler I'd ever seen at the time. A yeah. little, bit, little bit sad that the sort of back end of his time there was kind of very muddied when they yeah. started bringing him up. Oh, and Dixie Kai. It was oh, fucking terrible. And I can yeah. see jump ship. Uh, I have Christopher Daniels on mine. Um, I was going to say honourable mention to Christopher Daniels. Yeah, Christopher Daniels, the Fallen Angel, another one. Like He was, at one point, the greatest independent wrestler in the world. Oh, absolutely. He was the greatest unsigned talent. And um, he is the glue. When you talk about Styles and Shirley and whoever it is who was popular, Sanjay Dutt, Jay Leaf, it doesn't matter. Like They all kind of have Christopher Daniels in common. Um, So that's sort of the main three. And then it's kind of open-ended. I can understand why people would pick Sting, but then I think for me, to be on the Mount Rushmore, you have to have done your greatest body of work in that company for me. And Sting didn't. He was always much, much more. WCW. 
WCW and NWA is where he did his thing. Mm. So I'm probably, I, I'd like to put somebody more, I mean, it is my Mount Rushmore at the end of the day. Uh, Monty Brown would be very close. Out! <laughs> yeah, no, I love Monty Brown. He was I love favorite. Monty Brown so much. Long time. Um, I really loved LAX. I thought they were awesome, mm. both uh, iterations of it. But again, it's a tag team. Would you I can't put Shelly well? without Chris Sabin because I mean, t- you can, you can because Shelly done like his own body of work. Program. Yeah, but not enough for me to be yeah. considered better than the guys that I'm mentioning. So, I mean. You could say Kurt Angle, but again, his body of work... I mean, he was great in TNA, but his body of work, if you look w. at it, all his best stuff was in WWE or WWF. Um, so, yeah, again, you know, the other guys who were quite famous are our truth Ron Killings. Yeah, he yeah. made a real impact and was kind of really first got recognition in TNA. Mm. He's another guy who's done so much more since. Yeah. That it's hard. Like, to- there's, there's so many other guys now, I think back to it, like you've got Bobby Roode, You've got James Storm, Austin Aries, um, so many guys who have been Eric Young as well. Who's yeah? Um, yeah again, see, Eric Young is a guy that. Uh, do you know what? I'd probably say Eric Young actually, yeah. just because the sheer body weight. He went back there quite a few times, mm-hmm. and for me, still his greatest body of work and everything he's done has been in TNA over WWE. I like I, Sam. Yeah. But it- Small sample size compared to the rest of his career. So I'm going to very young with honorable mentions to Monty Brown, of course, because he's amazing. The Motor City Machine Guns, James Storm, uh, Bobby Roode. Um, I love Beer Money. I thought they were incredible. Beer Money was so good. involved with Team Canada was fucking awesome. Mm. Like, I love Team Canada as well. Pete, I forgot about PD Williams. Pete Jesus Williams. God. The problem with Peter Williams is that he never really felt like he kind of, I mean, a lot of people could argue someone like Bobby Lashley he did a lot in yeah. Team John Same. Morrison. Drew Galloway um, as well. I uh, I mean Josh Alexander will be on it when it's all yeah. said and done, but he's still going for me. So yeah. in, in a weird way, I've kind of gone with people who aren't in the company yeah. now. It is but, kind of mental to think though, because Impact keep posting it on their Instagram channel of highlights over the previous of the over the year of that. Come January fourth, Josh Alexander will be the longest reigning Impact champion of all time. I'm like, that's that's mental to me. <laughs> Yeah, I um, yeah, I, I think I'll stick with those guys. But there's a lot of guys that, when it all said and done, I think will definitely be up there. Yeah. You could do a Mount Rushmore just for the women as well. Oh, uh, I've, yeah, there's an amazing amount of women in there. I'd uh, probably put Taryn Terrell in mine. I thought she really, really. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, you've got um, awesome Kong. Gail Kim for me has got to be number yeah. one. Gail Kim, Mickey James. Mickey James has had an incredible run. Jordan Gracie's currently doing yeah. some of greatest ever in ring work i loved um i loved awesome kong's work in impact her matches with gail kim and all that stuff awesome kong's definitely up there for me awesome kong yeah again another one the thing is mount rushmore's a subjective yeah um moving on to movie related topics so uh Dave Batista is obviously right back in the mix of things with the new knives out film that's just dropped on netflix He's uh, uh, done a very successful yeah. role in that film, obviously. Um, rather interestingly, Guardians director uh, James Gunn explained in a since-deleted tweet thread how Batista has always let his characters envelop him mm-hmm. instead of consciously performing. And now Glass Onion director Ryan Johnson has a similar take. Uh, I absolutely 100% agree that Batista is the greatest wrestler to act uh, Ever, Johnson began responding to the Atlantic's David Sims in an interview published Monday. I think somebody like Paul Thomas Anderson is going to give him a real part and he's going to look like a genius. As a person, Batista is genuinely immediately vulnerable when you meet him. And that's why I, I was excited about this is someone who has the physical trappings of someone who could play it big, but he actually brings sensitivity to the role. Johnson further stated that Batista was the glass onion actor whose performance most pleasantly surprised him. When I was writing his character, a men's rights streamer named Duke Cody, I was picturing a scrawny dude who's trying to overcompensate. When Batista was brought up, I was instantly so smitten by the idea. I've been a very big fan of his dramatic chops as an actor, uh, and obviously you can watch it on Netflix as we speak. Do you agree that uh, Batista is the greatest wrestler to turn into an actor? It's, it's, I've got to agree to some degree, even though considering it's like, yeah, Dwayne Johnson's the most successful, but I think Dwayne Johnson's kind of been typecast in roles now. Yeah, I think, um, 
I think one of the biggest issues that you have with someone like The Rock as well is the fact that he is, uh, like you say, typecast. It's all very similar. It's all very samey. Even, um, you know, the Black Adam role, he's yeah. trying to stand there and look pretty. It's, There's not a great deal yeah. of depth to his roles, yeah. whereas with Batista, what, what I think is so I, important about Batista is the range. So yeah. you've had uh, a Bond uh, villain where he says one word, Inspector. Yeah. Then you've got Guardians of the Galaxy where it's this See? Yes. Uh, there was the film that I still need to watch called Hotel Artemis that he was in. And he's I haven't seen out. that. You've got yeah, obviously his role in Kickboxer. Um, you know, you've got this stuff with uh, Knives Out now. It just feels like, and also he's not doing roles. Every, like it feels like The Rock is in a, another film every two months. It's very saturated. It's and the he's one... all these different franchises. Yeah. Franchises then make a lot of money, but Batista, like you know, you can look at it from two ways. Are you successful because the amount of money you've made, or are you successful because of the quality of your work? And for me, I always look at quality of work because ultimately, yeah. McDonald's makes more money than anyone else on no, earth. Yeah. Food, who's having McDonald's ranked as their number one fucking yeah. meal of all time? Pretty much nobody. Yeah. It's yeah. just convenient. So that's yeah. kind of what The Rock is like. Yeah, McDonald's I feel no denying his brand success, mm. but the quality yeah. of work exactly, isn't exactly. I think the one actor who may surpass Batista, because even though he hasn't been doing it as long, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, between Bumblebee, I forget his other role with Amy Schumer, where he's just an absolute arsehole, and um, and uh, now uh, Suicide Squad and Peacemaker. He's and and he voice acted in Fernand in uh, Ferdinand. He's he's showing his range as well, but it's like it's it's similar to Batista though. He's very like choosing his roles he's not going for anything and everything so i think so i think i think that john cena and batista i'd say batista's just a bit up there because he's had like more time in the actor's world he was in army of the dead as well i still need to watch that that's really good i've seen army of the dead yeah yeah it's another one where he's really good good film um yeah no i mean again just like the mount rushmore of tna it's subjective but the bottom line is that i'm looking at your quality of work and everything I've seen Batista in has been pretty much world class or excellent. Uh, and many would argue that Guardians is the best of all of the Marvel films yeah. as well. So the fact he's part of that franchise is important. Yeah. Um, it's it's hard to think now because other than Batista, Dwayne Johnson, and uh, John Cena, what other like big wrestlers turned movie? Oh, Hogan, Robert? baby, Mister Nanny. <laughs> yeah, Hogan. What? Roddy Roddy Piper was in um They Live, but that was it. Yeah, he did like he did like he's renowned for one film. Yeah. So you know it's not a good enough body work. It's a great performance, one of the all-time great wrestling performances in a film, but it's not, you know, it it doesn't stand out as a body of work. Yeah. Um something that shouldn't stand out as a body of work is the fact that Raw hit its all-time record low oh, what? Uh, ratings this week. Uh it should be pointed out. It, it however, was a highlight show. <laughs> yes, thank you. Stop interrupting me. God damn it. There's only two of us and you're still interrupting me. Uh, I will kill you. Uh, December the 26th edition of WWE Raw, uh, about as bleak, as bleak as expected, garnered 1,075,000 viewers, um, which is the, um, uh, according to WrestleNomics, it was the least watched episode of Raw in its near 30 year history of approximately 352,000 of those viewers being in the key adults aged 18 to 49 demographic. But as we've said, it was a best of. 2022 show the only real thing of meaning on this was cody rhodes who made it a sort of interview appearance and basically hinted that yeah i'll be back pretty soon and he's obviously scheduled and alleged to be facing roman reigns at wrestlemania which means that we've probably got ourselves our rumble when i saw it here um do you look into this much Tambi is lost. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I had myself muted, so I wouldn't interrupt. One time, I do want you. To <laughs> you. So um, I think it. I think it was fine to do like a recap show and just show all the highlights because yeah, people can. People may have not seen these matches. Um, Cody making an appearance is pretty cool. I think. I think people have had it for a while now that Cody's winning the Royal Rumble. It's, for, for me, there's still... You're not answering the question. How are you, Tanvi? Like, do you look into the fact that they only got just over a million views and it's the lowest rate? No, 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 not really, you know, because it was, because it's like you said, it was a highlight show, so people probably have already seen these matches and they're like, do I really need to see these again? So that's probably why, and, and the thing, that's probably why it drew low viewers. At the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a highlight show and it's the end of the year, so it's kind of like a look back of like, this is what happened this year. Let's look forward to next year and what's going to happen. 
Yeah, well, I mean, on the flip side of things as well, SmackDown and AEW Rampage both saw their biggest ratings boost in months before the Christmas weekend. So SmackDown had 2,376,000 people tune in to watch it. Uh, Rampage also um, had uh, a total viewership averaging 566,000, which isn't fantastic, but is a lot better than some of the uh, sort of numbers they've had for quite a while now. Right? AEW has really struggled with ratings across the board, frankly, uh, to the point where some of his YouTube stuff is actually getting just as much views, if not more. Um, but the fact that, you know, let's not forget, SmackDown was taped this week as well. Yeah. Oh, so okay. A taped episode of SmackDown got 2.3, almost 2.4 million viewers. Mm-hmm. And that's obviously in the build up to the big one, which ends the year, which is, of course, the return of John Cena tagging yeah. with Kevin Owens against Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn. Mm-hmm. I have no doubt that that will get close, if not top that. Um, so, you know, it shows that I think with ratings, a lot of this is mental gymnastics. Yeah. AW fans are going to say, ha, raw shit, it only got a million views. <laughs> But it's a best of. On the flip side, you know, WWE fans will be like, <laughs> Rampage only got like 500,000, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the bottom line is, you know, it does it matter. Yes, it does if you are in charge of the company and you need yeah. to obviously go to TV executives and say, hey, look at our ratings. We deserve money. Let us have a longer contract. <laughs> but from a wrestling standpoint, <laughs> it's just, I really feel like the majority <laughs> of these things are put out there just to create tribalism between fans, but, which is yeah, not good. No. It's like when people say we hate AEW or we hate WWE, it's like, no, we're giving our opinions on things. Take it with a grain of salt. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it, people get sensitive about these things. Yeah. Um, but the fact that Amari Smackdown getting nearly 2.4 million viewers for a taped episode is fucking good business. Yeah. Really good business and shows that their move to Fox is one of the best pieces of business they've ever done in terms of TV. Um, yes, you know, the argument that people are using is that, ah, yes, but back in the day, Raw and SmackDown and WCW Nitro were getting 6 million, 7 million viewers at their peak. It's a different time with yeah. a lot of different TV. You can't use those metrics. We're in the same argument. We're in the era now of streaming and content and like everything is so content heavy. So it's kind of like, what does wrestling need to do to like make itself stand out? Do you think no um, companies like WWE and AEW would see better viewership if they went to streaming services? I think it depends which ones, to be honest. Because I mean, well, well, WWE... on Netflix, are more people watching it on there? I... They've still got the options of millions upon millions of different pieces of content to watch. Yeah, because they've got the they've got the um, the network. I think because I forget Lucha Underground was on Netflix, didn't do that well. That's true. Admittedly, <laughs> not the same kind of style. Very different. Very um, Latin American, and also not nearly the same reputation and yeah. fan base that Cause... something a WWE had. But it was a small yeah. sample size wrestling from what netflix and i can tell just doesn't work and if you're wwe you're not going to tell fox are paying you millions upon millions mm-hmm. I mean, something crazy like a billion dollars over 10 years or whatever it is um you know you're not going to turn that money down yeah. to you know risk the potential of streaming especially when the network already garners one to one and a half million subscribers yeah. as it does even with peacock involved yeah because i know here in the uk uh, um wwe's on bt sport and I don't know how much that costs, but yeah, so I don't know how much it costs in the US. Well, I mean, I pay about £15 a month for the app, okay. so I only watch it on my Xbox. Um, okay. I pay for it just so I can watch the stuff live or watch it yeah. back quickly without having to worry about it. For me, £15 a month, you know, isn't a huge deal, although it all adds up if you've got all these streaming services. Um, yeah. but for me, like you know, ultimately, a lot of these ratings as well. Let's not forget the majority of it all comes down to the United States, it's got nothing to do with us. We're not included in these yeah. ratings, they don't add on how many people watched on BT Sport. If they added on, for instance, how many people watch in India, they'd probably obliterate everybody. But you know, it oh, absolutely, <laughs> and ultimately, you know. <laughs> They're skewed numbers, depending on how you look at it. You know, what's going on? And there's so many, as always, the truth is never black or white. It's always in the middle. It's always in the gray area. And the bottom line is that these ratings only matter to a certain number of people and for people who just want to use an argument because they hate a wrestling company so much. You know, and the bottom line is if you, if, the thing is, what makes me laugh is AEW fans like, yeah, well, a Dynamite's getting nearly a million. Dynamite's like got, you know, Dynamite gets almost as much as Raw does. Like, okay, great. That doesn't mean that the show's better or worse. 
It just doesn't. Like, it, it, you know, it, you have to look at it from this perspective. Who's tuning in? Is there American football on? Is there baseball on? Is there ice hockey on? Is there a, and it, you know, like when we had the political runs, for instance, SmackDown, WWE pay-per-views were opening with like big matches. Remember that? Uh, I can't remember which pay-per-view it was, where they opened with a title match between John Cena, uh, AJ Styles, and John Moxley, uh, Dean Ambrose at the time, solely because everybody was watching the presidential, presidential yeah. candidate. I forget, yeah, I, forget, yeah, I think the one thing that's helped WWE as well is having pay-per-views on a Saturday. Thank fuck. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I mean, it's great for us, obviously. Yeah. It means it's not just great for us. I think it's great for the USA as well. I think, I think it's better. I think it's good. You know, like a Saturday night, you can stay out there. You know, you yeah. can enjoy yourself. You can have a drink. You don't have to wake up early in the next morning for most people. So, you know, I think that is a better suited thing. Um, but... Again, these all come down to arguments about tribalism. I just don't care enough. I really yeah, don't. Yeah, neither do I in terms of the ratings. I'm like, cool, people are watching wrestling, but it's just be like, don't be so like arse heavy. And I think it's like when people like AEW ultras, I'll say, it's like when they when they're like, oh, nothing's wrong. It's like you gotta take a look and give your opinion and be like, this is where you're going wrong, or else how is the product meant to meant to improve? And like garden more people in. If you're gonna gatekeep, why are people gonna be like, oh yeah, I want to be a part of the, I want to, I want to be. Turns a part me of off from the product. That's yeah. another one of the many reasons why I don't. I mean, AEW for me is not a product that caters towards me. I so, just fucking hate TV, gatekeeping. I'm turned off by these fans who are like, shit. Yeah. Well, I've been watching this since like, mate. I was at the first Dynamite. Yeah. I went to it. I spent a large amount of money to go to Washington and see the first Dynamite. I wanted to be a part of history. Mm. And for me, it was that thing of like, yeah, it was great at the time. But do you know what? I remember coming away, and this is it's always been a knock on effect for me personally with AEW because I remember going out there going to see dynamite and it was easily if you ask me probably the least interesting thing i did while i was out there i got to see yeah. friends that i'd never met before for 10 15 years like meeting up with lance and that i went to my first ever live baseball game a playoff game which the nationals won and ended up winning the nice. world and it was that thing i came away thinking i actually came out here to watch wrestling and ironically enough that was the least interesting thing i watched and I remember thinking yeah. from that point onwards, yeah, it was good. It was fun. But was it, you know, the ball bust that, you know, I wanted it to be like the opening episode of Nitro, uh, Lex Luger turns up and it just, you know, we got Jake Hager. Okay, great. Um, you know, I got to see that and I got to see a good women's match and got to see Cody and Sammy Guevara have a great match. But ultimately it was just a very good episode of TV. It was not, yeah. you know, the only thing that was historic about it was it was the first, not the actual content itself. And ever since then I've realized, you know what? You can make a big deal out of these things, but ultimately you're going to disappoint yourself. And that's what kind of happened with me. I came away a little bit disappointed with it. I'm glad I went. My tickets weren't ludicrously expensive. I think my ticket was about $100. It's really good. Okay. Good seats. Um, right in front of the entrance ramp. Uh, it was a decent arena as well. I think it's the Capital One in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, it was, it was it was a nice moment and a nice experience, but I will I never... I won't. I, I won't ever remember it as the greatest wrestling show yeah. in his life. Clash of the Castle was a much bigger deal and a much better yeah, show. Yeah, Clash of the Castle. So for me, with Wrestle Kingdom, when I went, I'm like that. That for me, it's like when I went to Japan. It was that like I mainly went out to go see Wrestle Kingdom, but I did so many other things that it's like Wrestle Kingdom was just kind of like just like a kind of blip. Because I still remember, I think we all agreed, me, my brother, and my best mate, that our favorite night in Japan was going to my brother's friends for the night. And we just stayed up till about five in the morning, just drinking. Did you go just, to the uh, Ribera Steakhouse? We did go to Ribera uh, night two. Get a jacket. Uh, I didn't have the jacket. I didn't get a jacket, unfortunately. How much are they? Uh, I don't know how much they are, but I know we went to because a lot of people went to um, went to like the bigger Ribera Steakhouse. We went to the original Ribera Steakhouse that Hogan went to that got famous. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we went to the original and just... Like a badge of honour, isn't it, for wrestlers who work yeah. in Japan to go to the Ribera Steakhouse and get just, the jet. Just going in there and seeing all the pictures of, like, you see Hogan, I think you see Andre, I think you see, like, so many different wrestlers over the years who have been to the Ribera Steakhouse. And, you're like, and I think just being in there, like, it was a damn good steak, but but it's being in being in there as well, of like, this, this is historical. Yeah, you're going for the experience more so yeah. than you are just for a good meal. Um... Yeah. Someone who looks like he needs a good meal right now is CM Punk, if I'm being honest. He looks quite oh, nice. 
Um, so CM Punk has been labelled a locker room cancer by several fans and wrestling pundits alike since the infamous All Out scandal. Um, that said, the likes of Dax Harwood and Ricky Starks have publicly defended Punk's stint with AEW, which began in August of 2021, uh, to the point where Starks put over Punk as a positive influence in the locker room and someone who exemplifies leadership in the truest form. GCW owner Brett Lauderdale uh, chimed in as well this week, um, where he said, our GCW experience with CM Punk was positive across the board. He was gracious, generous, giving of his time and energy, and happy to join us on his day off. He went above and beyond for everyone. Someday, when the time is right, I hope we can reveal the full details of our arrangement. The GCW boss was referring to Punk's appearance at the Indie Wrestling Hall of Fame ceremony back in January, where indie legends such as Ruckus, Lufisto, Homicide, Tracy Smothers, Dave Prazek, Jerry Lynn were honoured. Punk was at the event to induct Prazak, whom he referred to as the most influential person in independent wrestling history. Um, do you think that, obviously, with so many bribal marks, you know, who love the elite backing them over CM Punk, do you think CM Punk is, um, you know, deserves this moniker of a locker room cancer? I don't really know because I don't know if we as fans can really comment because we haven't got the whole story. We haven't got... <laughs> that's not stopped just, most fans, is it? <laughs> I know. And that that's the annoying thing. It's like you're just hearing he say about, like, oh, the elite and Jericho are saying that Punk... Kenny Omega said he doesn't like him, so I don't like him. <laughs> it's like saying Punk was a cancer and then you have Dax and others saying, of like, oh, no, he wasn't. So it's like, who do you really listen to? And I'm just, Yeah. And, and I trust I, FDR more than I do the Young Bucks or Kenny Omega to tell me the truth, because ultimately their entire historical runs in wrestling and their professional conduct has spoken far more to the credibility of wrestling than those guys. Yeah. I mean, just think alone, was it Cash who at um, Hall of Fame decked that guy for attacking Brett? Yes. Yeah. A legend, legend. Immedi- immediately yeah. in, in, in the good graces. Ass punch. <laughs> yeah. Surprised it didn't get done for assault, yeah. but you know. yeah. I know, I know, I know that Dax gets more of the attention because of more the look and he's more the mouthpiece of the team. But Cash Walder is a is a badass for that and a good man. Yeah, I mean they're hard bastards. Let's be honest. So yeah. you know what? Until we finally see some sort of resolution to what's going on, or we finally work out where Punk's going or what he's going to be doing, yeah. at this point I'm bored of hearing it. And I've never felt that Punk was a an all time great anyway. Yeah. No doubt, a great wrestler and a great mic. Per, I, uh, he's a good voice to wrestling, but I never felt like he was like a, an Austin or a, an Undertaker. I never saw him as one of these legends of the business like so many of our modern fans do. I think you put it best that in the time period that Punk was in, he was kind of the standout. That's why people were like, he's one of the greatest. because there well, He was counterculture in yeah. a time when WWE was awful. Like, yeah. the best of the rest. That was the problem for me was that, yeah, you're good, but if I drop you in the Attitude Era, all of a sudden you don't look special to me. Yeah. If I drop you in today's era even, with the way that WWE is now, with so many strong characters, like do I? I'd rather watch Roman Reigns and the Bloodline and Sami Zayn than I would CM Punk in his prime. Yeah. I would always watch Rock and Austin in the Attitude Era more. There's multiple things. Even in AEW, I've got to be honest, I'd rather watch MJF with what he's currently doing mm-hmm. than watch CM Punk. You know, the pipe bomb's great, but the fact that people always go back to that over everything else kind of says, yeah, he had historic moments, but he didn't have an historic career. And that's the big difference. Yeah. And loads of guys have had historic moments. Lex Luger had a massively historic moment and an upper nitro. Do we consider Lex Luger one of the top 10 greatest wrestlers of all time? Of course uh, not. <sighs> Let's talk about Tony Khan, shall we? <laughs> oh, we're going there. Yes, so on Monday, there. Fightful's Grapsody podcast published a new interview with AEW president and CEO Tony Khan, which ran just under 90 minutes. One such topic covered was Khan's booking style, specifically fans who think that there needs to be a clear storyline for a given match that has been set up in talking segments. As you might expect, Khan defended himself, particularly laying out how this was nothing new so much as a departure from modern WWE booking. Uh, He was quoted as saying, I think that it's something that I grew up with and it went away for a long time. And it's something we brought back. Khan began referring to matches that existed mainly as competitive vehicles. But there's so many people in those two decades plus that never saw it that weren't really familiar with a concept of wrestling matches where two people fighting for a win, fighting for a place in contention potentially, because it's going to set them up 
with a better situation in the company, more title opportunities, a better contract, the winner's share of the purse, etc., as the reason people want to win matches. But WCW Monday Nitro was the number one show on cable, and so much of it was two wrestlers going out. It wasn't even announced. It was just, okay, Rick Martel's going to come out and wrestle Prince Iakea. Okay, cool. Well, two luchadors, or a luchador and a wrestler from Japan, or Eddie Guerrero against a wrestler from Japan, or Chris Jericho against a wrestler from Japan. And I loved it. It was fun. And the person who produced these shows has gone and worked other places. And it's like he forgot all the stuff he did. And then he's like, why would anybody do this? You don't see that on TBS and TNT. You're the one who did it. Palm was referring to Eric Bischoff, whose criticism he had previously addressed in October. Um, Bischoff largely doubled down on his take in response, of course. Khan further added that he felt one criticism was in particularly bad faith that there were no storylines whatsoever in AEW. The worst criticism, the fakest criticism, was this criticism of, I don't want to say it because people would make it a quote. They'll pull out the things you say as a portion of a quote within a quote, but people question if there were storylines in AEW. And I'm like, are you shitting me? There's so many in every show. And out of five or six matches in a show, most of them will have those hooks. And I got to say, on next week's show, looking at it, every match will have a story going into it on Dynamite. And there will be weeks where it's a match where two wrestlers are wrestling each other for the first time. But maybe it's going to lead somewhere for one of them, for both of them, together, separately. Watch it and find out. That's the thing. I think everyone trying to call stuff in advance is good in terms of how it keeps people watching wrestling, which is great. Khan then circled back to Bischoff's complaint, saying, frankly, on Nitro, it was usually just two guys wrestling and it didn't go anywhere, he added. And that's not what I do. And that would be the greatest sin. And the person who complains is actually the person who did this more than anybody, which is the irony. And why are we dancing around his name? I don't know, Eric. So Tony Khan mm. launching into a massive diatribe about how Eric Bischoff has no right to complain about a lack of storylines uh, in AEW and stuff like that. But there is premise to Eric Bischoff's argument. For instance, Ring of Honor Final Battle, they literally gave FTR versus the Briscoes three days hype. Yeah. Three days for the dog collar match. Um, not to mention the fact that they actually had matches on there that were announced on the day, like the Kingdom. So, and people say, well, that's Ring of Honor. Well, AEW is booking it. Tony yeah. Khan is booking it. There's a multitude of things that just randomly seem to happen on Dynamite. Yeah. Absolutely no fucking build whatsoever. Um, first of all, does Eric Bischoff have credibility? And second of all, is Tony Khan right to defend his booking in this scenario? I think he's right to defend his booking because, I mean, it's his booking. If he can't defend it, then what's the fucking point? Uh, I think Eric, Eric Bischoff has validity too because, I mean, he did WCW. It's just the thing with AEWs, right, is that there's so many... It's like you just said a minute ago. There's so many random things on Dynamite and Rampage. And the thing is... Our review from last week. Yeah, because the thing is, two to three years ago when AEW was announced, do you remember what the first thing was that they said at the press conference? Wins and losses are going to matter. And they don't fucking matter. They don't fucking matter. Three years on. So uh, I don't get it. And the thing is, when you have dark and dark elevation and all this and you're like oh yeah these guys want on dark and dark elevation who fucking cares <laughs> i don't they're facing some random job is great it only matter if you see them that's yeah. the thing like and we don't see the majority like um you know someone said something like uh serpentico's like owens 176 mm -hmm. or something ridiculous like that and everyone's mm -hmm. like yeah, but you know and it's like well why is he still wrestling mm -hmm. then if he loses all the fucking and I think and I think some people are like, oh yeah, Ruby and Willow Knight, Ruby Riot and uh, Willow, uh, Ruby Soho, I mean, and Willow Knight and Gail are teaming up as this cool tag team. I'm like, well, why are they showing that on Dark then? Why aren't they showing it on main TV when you've got, when you've meant to have these two amazing women? I don't think it's true that AEW has no storylines because there's clearly some. It, it but, has. But the problem is that it doesn't have enough. And the storylines that it does have, predominantly other than MJF and that, are not long-term storytelling. It's like a month at best. And this is the first thing, when you ask AEW fans, why do you hate WWE so much? Oh, they don't have proper feuds. They don't have proper rivalries. Well, the bloodline is absolutely shitting on any storyline in terms of its quality of booking and its quality of performance and anything WWE has done, uh, that AEW has done in the last two or three years. I mean, I mean, here's, here's the thing as well, is when people say about other oh, feuds, it's like, yeah, but the bloodline is that. 
but you've had Seamus v Gunther this year. You've had the whole Dexter Loomis miss thing that's just happened. You've had um um yeah, Seth I think, Rollins and Austin yeah, Theory. Seth Austin Rollins, Theory's Austin Theory. Been a long burn. You know, he's turned back into great. Bobby Lashley, Brock Lesnar. Fuck me, that was awesome. Yeah, they. I, I just. I think what WWE is doing is doubling down on the strength of its yeah. storylines. Um, so yes, AEW may very well on many occasions have better wrestling matches, but that doesn't mean any... Mm. The current wrestling fan doesn't watch wrestling solely for good wrestling because otherwise yeah. we'd all just go and watch our local indies. Yeah. Like for me, for instance, I did Rumble the other day. Tate Mayfair's and Danny Black had a better match than pretty much any match I've seen on Dynamite in months. Yeah. So I, I don't would... go and watch that. Uh, I'd say with wrestling now, for me, it's more so the character-wise of like, oh yeah, I can, I can, like, there's such a big emphasis on work right now, and there were so many great wrestlers, but I'm like, okay, they're great wrestlers, but where's the character? And that's why, like, guys like Tate Mayfair stand up to me, Jay White, I fucking love Jay White's character, and AEW, I'd say, like, John Moxley, Hangman, WWE, you've got Roman, Sami Zayn. It's more so that character-wise. So I think, and I think the big issue with AEW is, is that it does have storylines. It does have long-term storylines. But there's one common, de- common denominator in every single one of those long storylines. And it's fucking Chris Jericho. He's the only one who seems to basically get carte blanche to do whatever he wants all the time. And the majority of it is boring or rubbish yeah. or very egotistical and very kind of self-absorbed, which is fine from a character standpoint. But when it starts bleeding into the quality of the other matches and the quality of the locker room, then it becomes an issue. Um, but I, I've made this argument a few times and I've said to people, I don't think like matches are great and you have to have good matches to be a good wrestler. Yeah. But the most important thing will always be who you are as opposed yeah. to how you wrestle. Because otherwise, look at all the greatest drawing wrestlers of all time. Hulk Hogan, John Cena, Undertaker, yeah. The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin. None of them are the best wrestlers of all time. They are the greatest entertainers slash wrestlers. Yeah. That's the big difference. Uh, I think that one thing with wrestling matches now is that I've noticed is, is that you can feel when the guys wrestling are having fun working together. Because it's like, I, I always go back to, I think, tw- 20, it's either 2019 or tw- it's 2020 when Edge came back. The opening match of that Royal Rumble was um, Roman Reigns versus Baron Corbin. And initially, I think everyone was like, oh, this is going to be just piss poor. Ended up being one of the funnest matches I've seen because everybody working in that match, you could just see them. Yeah, they were they were having the facial expressions, but you could tell inside they're having fun doing this, like entertaining everyone. It was it was amazing. So I found a fantastic little article which also builds into our list for the week. Ooh. So um uh you probably won't remember this name, a man by the name of Harry Del Rios. Uh, may not be a household name of professional wrestling, but he did appear briefly for companies like WWF and TNA at the peak of his career. Fans may remember him better as the Spellbinder or Fantasio character, a wrestling magician who wore a black and white mime mask when he entered the arena, only to reveal similar face paint when he took the mask off. So Del Rios only made one televised appearance when he was working with WWF, a match against Tony DeVito on a July 16th, 1995 episode of WWF's Wrestling Challenge. But why was the star with a fun promising giving sack so quickly? Bruce Pritchard let everyone know about this on his Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard po- podcast this week. Uh, when issues arose, when one of Fantasio's magic tricks brought chaos backstage. Oh. This dumb shit is sitting there getting ready to go out and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, he's got a little container about, you know, the size of a, a visine bowl, maybe a little bit bigger. He drops it. And next thing I know now, I'm backed up and I'm surrounded by pipe and drapes all around me. And then there are the curtains they go out of. Well, I'm on fire. The gorilla position is on fire. And Kevin Dunn is screaming, send him. And I go, fire. He goes, send him. I was like, God damn it. Gorilla's on fire. Get me a fire extinguisher now. This individual, uh, famous for setting the gorilla position on fire in his only appearance in WWF. Richard notes during the podcast that Fantasio's intention was to use liquid fire he had brought along with an awe-inspiring illusion during his television debut. He had some kind of liquid fire that I guess magicians use or whatever. I guess he was going to have some fire or something. Didn't tell anybody, so he didn't have it approved by a fire marshal. He's in a small enclosed area surrounded by flammable drapes, and he fumble fucks, drops the shit, and the 
drapes are going up in fire. Understandably, Pritchard uh, and other WWF employees were frazzled with how something so dangerous happened during what was supposed to be a standard TV taping. I was livid, beyond livid, Pritchard adds. Fantasio was directed to wrestle his match and was booked to win, while staff put the fire out and dealt with the aftermath. As soon as he reached the backstage area, Pritchard met Fantasio with a barrage of words, and the magical persona didn't appear on WF television ever again. That was his best trick oh to gosh. disappear. <laughs> Pritchard finished savagely. Fantasio would wrestle once more, however, for WF in a loss against Aldo Montoya in a dark match in 1970. Oh, okay. He periodically showed up on the independent scene in the years that followed, with his last recorded match being in Railway, New Jersey in 2012 for a former indie promotion known as Pro Wrestling Syndicate. Uh, okay. held the event. Pro Wrestling Syndicate held the event where Fantasio was victorious against fellow former WWE persona, Simon Dean. Quickly, before this leads to our fantastic little list, um, we're in a position being set on fire. Good good or bad mm. one to uh, uh, yourself in your first appearance in a company. It's hilarious, and now if there's any footage out there, I want someone to edit Firestarter over the top of it. always record backstage <laughs> for this stuff. Uh, um, <laughs> imagine, this footage would go viral if it was available. Viral. <laughs> I just want to see Bruce <laughs> Pritchard on fire and laughing because the guy's a gimp. Um, and just Fantas- if I want Fantasia making his entrance and just Firestarter over the top of it. <laughs> well, I have a list here that ties in very nicely to this. Nice. The top 10 spookiest moments in WWE history. Ooh, I'm okay. going to read these out to you and I want you to tell me whether they are yay, very spooky, mm. or nay, very mm. fucking stupid. Cool. And we start with number 10, Papa Shango curses the ultimate warrior. In the early 90s, mainstream pro wrestling was heavy, mm. heavily entrenched in branding itself mostly for younger demographics. Uh, which meant some zanier antics during this period. Charles Wright, who, of course, people will remember being repackaged as the Godfather, uh, used to be Papa Shango, a voodoo-themed heel, complete with skull makeup, patterned after the Baron Samadhi character from Live and Let Die, the James Bond series. Um, Shango's magical chicanery resulted in the uh, Ultimate Warrior violently puking on WWF medics and oozing a bizarre blood-like liquid. For any kids watching at the time, this could have been very unsettling. Is it spooky or is it dumb? I don't think... I don't think I've seen... I might have seen it ages ago. I think I, think I find it a bit dumb. Yeah, to me, it's dumb. I mean, it, it's one of those things, like the Exorcist movie. When I saw it, I thought, what's all the big hoo-ha about? It's a bit dumb. But at the time, people were fainting and throwing up at cinemas. I think it's based on the, you know, who you're playing to at the time. At yeah. the time, it was probably quite revolutionary. But the problem is as well, Ultimate Warrior always looked like he was about one fucking dodgy sentence away from throwing up anyway. Because of yeah. the shit in his system. So, <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't really that bothered. Number yeah. nine... Where to, Stephanie? Um, rather famously, Undertaker in front of the, uh, as the driver of the limousine, Stephanie gets in the limousine, he shoots around during the entry, he goes, where to, Stephanie? And they abduct her and cause the unholy wedding on Raw, where Stephanie was infamously saved. What by year was this? So cold, 1999, I believe. Okay. Yes, it was, 1999. Yeah. So that was the- or dumb. That was the year I was born, and I think when they showed it, I think years later on on the WWE show, I think as like a as like a throwback, I was like, oh, that's pretty that's pretty scary. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I'm getting in my limousine, I'm driving away. Oh yeah, there's this dead guy who's like, where to? <laughs> it's so essentially funny. a zombie in the front seat, it's basically spooky. driving you and then abducting you and trying to it's... marry you against your will so he could rape you and have unholy children. It's Definitely spooky. spooky. It's like years looking back, looking back on it now. It's like a it's like a Disney skit of just like I'm just like, oh yeah, getting in my car and you just have the turn back. Yeah. It's like without the context of like you said of the oh yeah this guy's gonna. gonna Is it, however, as good as when Braun Strowman was seen at the back of the limousine uh, that Miz was in and he freaked out? <laughs> no, that yeah. was that was dumb. <laughs> that was a terrible try. They tried to redo it and it was awful. No. Um, so this man's probably going to be on this list quite a bit, I imagine. The Undertaker gets buried alive for the first time. He's in at number eight. Um, so. Uh, one such moment in Undertaker's crazy, spooky moments of career. Uh, in 1996, in a feud with Mick Foley, who'd recently debuted as Mankind, 
a twisted and tormented soul with a penchant for sadomasochism. Mankind turned his in-ring encounters with the Undertaker into brutal affairs. Things escalated when Taker's longtime manager, Paul Bearer, turned on him, aligning himself with Mankind. The two collided in a truly memorable outing at In Your House Buried Alive, where Undertaker was rather famously buried alive for the first time. And at the end of the uh, show, lightning struck the uh, grave. And of course, uh, he, well, a thunderclap was heard and the purple glove burst from yeah. the ground. Uh, spooky or dumb? Looking I mean, back at it. Iconic. It, it's iconic, but I think it's a bit dumb. It's not really spooky to me. It doesn't really feel like spooky. I watched it uh, pretty much live at the time as a kid. And uh, I must admit, I was like, at the time, incredibly spooky. Now, more hilarious than spooky. Yeah, it is more hilarious to me. It's purpose at the time. Number seven, the Wyatt family debut. No need to fucking give you any details on that. The Wyatt family debuting, assaulting Kane, actually, of all people, on their mm -hmm. debut on the main roster, where they finally announced that they were here. Of course, they had all these incredible vignettes with them on the farm and the hillbillies and the digging and all this kind of weird stuff. This house that you know nobody could find on the map. Yeah. To be, it's, yeah, it was spooky, and I'm also very grateful to Bray Wyatt because from studying his character work, I was able to get an A star in GCSE drama. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. yeah, I thought it was fucking phenomenal. It was awesome. Too. Definitely one of the most uh, fantastic supernatural moments they've had in the modern age and probably one of the only good ones since uh, that point. Uh, number six, interesting enough for me, isn't necessarily more spooky as it is just terrifying. Mankind falling through hell in a cell during his infamous <laughs> with The Undertaker. Not scary, not not spooky, more scary and terrifying of like, yeah, oh yeah, that, yeah we've, just spooky about it. we've just witnessed a guy die. And it's and it's like I think we said a couple. It's of weeks terrifying, ago. just it's terrifying cool. from the perspective of he could have literally killed himself. It's the um, greatest. It's the greatest commentary call of all time because it's so real. Of like J of JR being like, hey, he's broken in half. Of like he's he's dead. Yeah. Um. So number five is the debut of the fiend. Which one is what? Is it Raw or SummerSlam? Um, it's when he uh, arrived on Raw and attacked uh, Finn Balor. That I I would say that was kind of spooky. If it was the SummerSlam like entrance when he debuted, that was spooky. That yeah, was terrible. at that point we'd already kind of seen a little bit of him. I think for me it was more the original kind of stuff where that that really sharp terrifying horror music would play and then he'd appear with strobe lights and start choking people out with a glove um, and yeah. that was fucking cool reminded me very much of when i was a kid and mankind would do yeah. the same thing with a mandible claw uh yeah definitely spooky mm. number four is macho man being attacked by jake roberts snake spooky spooky yeah first time i'd ever seen an animal attack a wrestler um, at least, you know, unless you want to watch the bunkhouse brawl, which is, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, um, you know, where a goat fucking yeets, I think it's a bull or a goat or something, yeets Terry Funk up in the air, and it's just hilarious, is what it is. It's, it's just stupid. Um, had the kennel of the kennel from hell as well, and like so many other animal related wrestling matches. Yeah, this for I mean, this was 1991 on Superstars of Wrestling. This was Macho Man Randy Savage. He was a big fucking deal. You had Elizabeth screaming at ringside, crying because her husband or gay vape husband at the time was being mauled by, you know, Jake Roberts was evil, trying to take advantage of her. And then he actually, you know, apparently the story goes that he actually had a bit of beef with Savage and wound up the snake enough that he could legitimately bite the fucking cunt. And they had a nightmare. Yeah. Um, getting him off of him because the snake was so fucking riled up. Luckily for them, he'd been devenomized. Um, but yeah, it was quite an image seeing this snake chomping yeah. Macho Man's bicep. It was pretty gnarly at it, the time. It, it was it was terrifying. <laughs> Number three, the Undertaker. He's back in again, baby. Sacrificing Stone Cold Steve Austin on the infamous Undertaker cross on Raw, where he stood underneath him like that while Austin was <laughs> tied to it and raised up. Um, I think pretty much everything that the ministry did had an mm -hmm. eerie sense of creepiness about it, yeah. which for me worked very well and cemented it the Undertaker's legacy as a real dark, yeah. evil entity. It went beyond this mysterious zombie character mm -hmm. to this guy's like a fucking cult leader who's yeah. going to kill people. Like, I think, would you, I think Ministry of Darkness might be my favourite 
and then it'll be yeah. American Badass. Definitely his best theme for me, the one with the electric guitar. Like, yeah, oh, oh, yeah baby. Um, yeah, good shit. Definitely spooky. Number two yeah. is the Firefly Funhouse match between John Cena and Bray Wyatt. Now, no. I don't think this is spooky, but it was fucking entertaining. It was fun. Most importantly for the puppets, where uh, Vince McMahon's got, this is such good shit. It's it was- fucking incredible. One of my favourite moments in modern history is just that it- his take of him when he's like, hey, John, what's going on, pal? So funny. I love it. It's uh, Robert and Tanvi is currently being accosted for uh, probably not eating his dinner or whatever by his mother. Um, yeah, for me, um, it wasn't spooky, but it was very, very, very entertaining, very funny. There was this wonderful kind of... You you never expected it. And of course, it was during the pandemic era. We were talking about the fact that, you know, wrestling wasn't in front of an audience, and yet they somehow were able to create this cinematic thing. And obviously, we'd seen this wonderful cinematic piece between Undertaker and AJ Styles, but then the next night... We get Cena versus in, in the Twilight Zone, the supernatural entities. Um, before Tanvir was obviously interrupted by one of his magical members of his family. Uh, mm-hmm. Tanvir, is the Firefly Funhouse match spooky, dumb, or neither? <laughs> I'd say neither. It was more entertaining. It had a John Cena NWO as well. That's fun. <laughs> And number one on this list, and I would agree as arguably the most chilling moment for me in wrestling history, is the debut of Kane at Hell in a Cell 1997 Bad Blood, where he ripped the cage off the door, tombstone the Undertaker, and cost him the number one contendership for the WWF title. I remember being fucking enraged as a Bret Hart mark as well, because I hated Shawn Michaels guts. I want to see Shawn Michaels die. I was like, Undertaker's going to kill you, fucking Gim. And then Kane turns up, the red lights. I'm 12 years old. I'm watching it live. You got Paul Barrow. Oh, it's like, the whole thing it's, like freaked me the it, fuck out. Brilliant. It, it's Cinematic still masterpiece. It's still up there as like the greatest debut of all time for, for me. Yeah. For Kane. yeah. And I think I think the fact that even to this day, pe- people and fans are still quoting JR, it's gotta be Kane. It's it is it is terrifying at the time and looking back on it, it's so iconic. Well, that brings to the end a phenomenal list, actually. As we said, well done wrestling. That's great. That together very nicely. So, Tanvir, we can double down and have one more list, or we can just talk about all the other boring shit that's happened in wrestling this week. Oh, another list, absolutely. Can I throw a couple honorable mentions into the spooky one? Sure, man. Um, it was the it was the Undertaker Randy Orton stuff of like when I think Randy Orton opened a when Bob, Bob, the Bob Orton like covered in blood, and then he sort of shakes, mm-hmm. and then like Bob's Orton's fine, his dad, yeah, and he's. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's like he opens up the casket, nothing in there, closes it, opens up again, and then takers in there. I'm like, that's scary. I think I think like majority well, of the, stuff the that casket, there... and you actually have Randy Orton in there, and they had the lifelike dummy of him. That was really good. Yeah, yeah that, that was, d- pretty funny. Yeah, because I grew up. I think. How about that Triple life... H fucking a corpse? <laughs> <laughs> How about that, pal? <laughs> you know what? Have you ever seen the interview with Vince McMahon where he's asked about that and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah it's funny. Yeah, it's funny. you got to admit, it's so funny. Like the idea of someone having sex with a corpse. Having sex with dead people is funny, pal. It's like, uh, Vince? <laughs> no. <laughs> that is a PR nightmare. Who allows me <laughs> to go out there and say that? On- Vince, Vince McMahon, big necrophiliac. <laughs> Good mm. to know. What about uh, Tori Wilson's um, dad dying of a heart attack because he was oversexed by Dawn Marie? Oh, God, I didn't know that. Yeah, and then rather amusingly, he was at ringside for a match of hers about six or seven years later, and then sadly passed away a couple of years ago in real life, oh. bless his heart. Oh. Yeah. Spooky yeah. <laughs> for different reasons. Um, man being into necrophilia yeah. <laughs> to close well, up. Something that was chilling for the wrong reasons was probably all the animals, the dogs I was watching in the kennel of hell hump each other when they were supposed to. <laughs> Evil Rottweilers between Boss Man and yeah. Al Snow, making him eat his own dog. Like even at fourteen, I was like, I don't like that. I like I like dogs too much. Fuck I you. love dogs. Dogs are the purest of creatures. Yeah, I, I didn't like that. I was like, how for that moment onwards, I was like, yeah, Boss Man can die in a bin. I don't care. And sadly, mm-hmm. uh, Ray Trainer has actually passed away. Rest in peace. But yeah. Jesus Christ, Vince Russo. How? Fine. How? How is that on a not on a spooky or terrifying moment of Big Show Big Show driving the hearse with the casket? That's just funny. 
when he's like on top of his dad's car, <laughs> crying at the funeral, and boss man's like, "I'm taking your daddy." <laughs> it's what the fuck is there? Vince McMahon's point of go, "Yeah, that's good shit, pal." <laughs> it's, it's, it's so do- it's so dark and hilarious, but for it's, all the not he fucking that would have definitely fucking signaled the, the you know get rid of this gun he don't know what he's doing um <laughs> jesus lord almighty how about fucking stephanie man essentially being married to triple h and essentially date raped because he knocked her out and then they got married what the fuck is that all about triple h has been up to some right dodgy shenanigans actually he's fucked a corpse he's date raped somebody fucking all kinds of crazy things. Yeah. He's been a busy, busy boy. Yes, what a career. But was it? Was it Test who kicked the baby? <laughs> no, that was Gene Snitsky. Yeah, G- yeah, Snitsky kicking the baby. That is one of the funniest moments in history. And obviously, as somebody of my uh, ilk who fucking hates children, I was all for yeeting babies into the audience with a whopping great pun. Do you know what? Come at me, internet. I don't care <laughs> if if I see someone Johnny Wilkinson a child into an audience. <laughs> gonna piss my pants laughing i don't fucking care Johnny kids. Wilkinson, a child. I hate kids i hate them fucking <laughs> rubbish i just, I just rubbish. Love, it. I love the way that you said it's like i oh, am not punk kick them you're like no johnny wilkinson them into the yeah. audience world cup 2003 it's england for the win seriously i'd love to read if anyone's child was that unruly there should be a rule where if a kid steps out of line too much you're allowed to give him the johnny wilkinson pun and then somebody replays the infamous commentary when england win the world cup in 2003 yeah yeah good shit Good shit. I, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Aaron Nix, and I approve the message that it is okay to yeet babies into the audience via Gene Snitsky's massive boots. Good shit, pal. Right. Moments when The Undertaker went too far. So, I want you to tell me whether these are, frankly, hilarious, or they legitimately went too far and happened. So, Undertaker burying Paul Bearer alive in concrete. (laughs) I remember this. This was at Great American Bash, wasn't it? Yeah, what a terrible pay per view, by the way. One of the I ones. remember seeing this live and being like, "Why the, the fuck event is was he the doing Dudleys this?" Versus the Undertaker in a handicap match. I'm like, "Why are they doing this?" I'm and like, he's like, "So is... you know, he's like, I'm sorry." And then Undertaker goes, "I'm sorry, Paul," and pulls down the lever, and he's like, oh, "He drowns in the car." Oh, fuck. That's got shut down. I can just see bits of ass like, oh, it's funny when fat people die in concrete. Am I right, Bruce? Laugh, you piece of shit, or I'll fire you. Like, I could just see him doing it. Uh, like, punching people are going, oh, it's no, funny. It was not it's good. Fat fuck's going to die in concrete. It's <laughs> a, oh, 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 got it was, shit. It was not good. It was not good. It was funny. Uh, even, <laughs> even at the age of fucking 19, I was pissing my pants laughing. Uh, Midian being sacrificed. For the Ministry of Darkness. Um, yeah, take the case of one Dennis Knight kidnapped by Undertaker's acolytes on an episode of Raw that aired in January of 1999. As KB Wrestling Reviews describes the incident, Knight was first shown being held captive in a dungeon, but was later brought out and tied to an altar where he was forced to drink a chalice of Undertaker's own blood. After this gruesome ritual, he had the dead man's symbol carved into his chest and was rechristened Midian, thus taking his place in the Ministry of Darkness. And of course, he would then go on to reveal his cock in front of a live audience, ladies and gentlemen, as naked Midian, who would legitimately run down to the ring during random matches, stark bollocks naked with his cock out and just a bum bag (laughs) for fucking coverage. Uh, Yeah, too far or hilarious or both? (laughs) hilarious not too far because it's like we said it was it was like a cult and this is kind of what cult leaders leaders in a way in, would do so it's more hilarious it's how more... about then a live lynching at wrestlemania 15 where big boss man was hung from the hell in the cell by the undertaker this was legitimately too... with a noose around his neck <laughs> this was too far because of the vi- the visual and you and i think it's still shown around today and used in memes and you're like oh this this was not good Who, whoever thought of this is a sick bastard yeah, the brood uh, Christian Edge and Gangrel were part of ministry at the time, knocked a hole into the cage, then lowered a noose through the hole, take a loop the noose around his fallen foe's neck, then Paul Bearer worked some kind of mechanism that lifted the cage and boss man up into the air where he hung suspended above 
the ring. And once <laughs> again, Vince is back. Oh, fuck, I, shit. Oh, oh, I saw this video about people getting hung and I thought that'd be funny. It's fucking terrifying visual. And I mean, mental health back. How'd you do it uh, now? It's oh, fucking... Lord. You know what? I really hope that Tim White's suicidal tendencies is on here. Do you remember those? <laughs> Oh, we, we need to, well, if it's not on here, we'll talk about it afterwards. Uh, mankind being thrown off Hell in a Cell. Too far? Not too far. Not too far because it was Foley's idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, apparently, we got a double take here because we just mentioned it in the spookiest moments. But uh, uh, Undertaker returning uh, you know, from the grave when his arm burst out. Is that too far? I don't That's think. not too far because it's his whole character. He's the dead man. It's like you can't kill him. How about Undertaker sending Edge straight to the bad place? Uh, the background to Edge versus Undertaker oh. at 2008 SummerSlam was a feud that had been going on for over a year. As TGR Wrestling tells it, the two had tangled at WrestleMania, but Taker Street continued. A victory by the rated R superstar at a TLC match, however, came with a stipulation that the dead man would leave WWE. Well, obviously, that retirement didn't take. Uh, in fact, it was then GM Vicky Guerrero who brought Undertaker back as she wanted revenge on her kayfabe husband Edge for his cheating ways. The match ended in a win for Taker, but not content with taking Edge out of the match, he decided to take him all the way out of this world by choke slamming him off a ladder and into a fiery pit that opened up in the ring. Too far <laughs> or too comical? Too comical. It's way it's too the comical. Idea that flames were burst now. I was like, well, Edge is, Edge is literally. They legitimately tried to imply that they had sent Edge to hell. Hell. Yeah. Booking yeah. hell, maybe. <laughs> Booking uh, hell. <laughs> how about making an uninvited appearance at Randy Savage's wedding? While Mr. and Mrs. Matra were opening their wedding gifts, uh, she was in the Princess Diana puffy sleeves. He was in a hat with the world's tallest feather. They were shocked by the sudden arrival of something slimy and scaly, along with the cobra that accompanied him. <laughs> we're talking, of course, about Savage's nemesis, Jake the Snake Roberts, but Roberts and the deadly reptile didn't arrive alone. The dead man was riding shotgun, come with his urn to cast a curse on the blessed occasion. With such an ill omen, how could the wedding have been anything but doomed? Undertaker cursing Savage and Elizabeth's wedding with an urn. So far, it's, it's comical. It's so comical. All right, is this too far? Strapping Stephanie McMahon to a Undertaker-like cross and trying to force her into an unholy union where she would literally be raped and give birth to the Undertaker's demon seed. It's 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 horrifying too far, and it's where like Stephanie. <laughs> where to, Stephanie? It's like, yeah, I'm gonna take you, and I'm gonna. <laughs> do, 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 do said rape <laughs> like, no. beating the shit out of Ric Flair's son um, <laughs> so I'm not sure if you remember this uh, David Flair had a short run as a WCW mid-carder when WWF brought out, uh, bought out that promotion Flair did get to keep his job but as recounted by the sportster, was moved into a developmental position before eventually leaving the industry altogether. During the cup of coffee he had with WWE, Flair at least had the honor of being in a squash match with the Fiend on himself. In the run-up to WrestleMania 18, when they faced each other, the dead man showed up at OVW and pretty much beat the shit out of David while also cutting a promo uh, while he cradled him in the shower. <laughs> Too far? Not far enough. Um, I'd say t I'd say T far, but David Flair still has like one of the greatest themes ever. <laughs> uh, how about uh, Yokozuna being set on fire? <laughs> I don't know if that's too far. So the way Undertaker tells it in the documentary series The Last Ride, he and his Bone Street crew were hanging around in a hotel room where he started lighting matches and flicking them at people. One of the ones he flipped across the room went right over Yokozuna's head, or so everyone thought, at least until they tried to smell the smoke. According to the dead man, I said, hey, Rod, Rodney, obviously, Rodney Anawai, Yokozuna, turn around. He turns around, and sure enough, his hair is on fire. Crew members started pounding on him to put the fire out, although Taker admits that some of them might have pounded a bit too hard just for the fun of it. The big uh, man, however, took both burning hair and beating his stride as he did most things. As Taker said on the Out of Character podcast, yeah, Yoko and I were very close. There's not a day that goes by where I don't think about him. Too far to legitimately set one of your fellow wrestlers' heads on fire, pissing around with matches. 
I mean, <laughs> living the gimmick, pal. I don't know if it's too far or it's just banter. <laughs> Here's a good one for you. Paul Bear and Undertaker were also friends out of the ring. So dedicated was Bear to his manager slash acolyte role, though, that at times he wouldn't even break kayfabe, even in times of direst need. One such incident occurred while the two were traveling back from Vancouver. As Bear related in a shoot interview with Ring of Honor, he desperately had to use the restroom, but Taker told him to pump the gas first. As Bera said, as any of you men out there know, there's just something about holding a hose with water going through it that just, it's the worst. As might have been expected, an accident ensued, and Paul Bera pissed himself. But the dead man didn't keep the news to himself. When Bera arrived at his hotel room an hour later, he found a present, a present awaiting himself from Vince McMahon, a box of adult diapers. That's too, that's too far. Adult that's diapers. Too, oh, too much, bro. Yeah, but you could, can you imagine? Being Undertaker, you go it so Undertaker's like walks in, he's like, ha ha ha, like, what's so funny, pal? He's like, oh, Paul Bear pissed himself at the gas. Ah, like, oh, I've got a great idea. Linda, give me some of your diapers. That's <laughs> fucking, oh, fucking hilarious. Fucking cunts wrestlers are, I tell you. Uh, Goldberg being concussed at a Saudi botch fest. The match between Undertaker and Goldberg in Saudi Arabia. No thing, nothing else really needs to be said about it. Too far or not too far or just bloody awful. Bloody awful. Well, it, it didn't need to fucking happen. Well, you find worse matches by one of the greatest wrestlers to ever live. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. Astonishing. And that was when you realised you need to call it a day, bud. Yeah. Um, his last ever match... Uh, and finally, the moment where he could have been considered to have gone too far is when he buried AJ Styles alive in the boneyard. Mm. But that was kayfabe, so I yeah, don't... that was that's fine. Didn't go that's too good far. Visual. That's good visual. Yeah. I also like it when uh, AJ Styles actually eventually did come back on Raw, and there's a moment in a promo where he goes, "I was buried alive a few weeks ago, and nobody even bloody know it." <laughs> it's, it's so funny. <laughs> really funny. He proper goes off on one. He's like, "I was fucking killed. I was <laughs> killed." <laughs> What's wrong with you people? Oh. He's actually, I think it's on his Twitch stream or something. He starts going into it. He's like, it oh, might I've be. died on TV and none of you better than knowledge. You're all dickheads. <laughs> it is very funny. He's, oh. I love Oh, man. So cool. So good. All right. Any other business? Anything else you want to talk about before we get out of here, bud? Can't think of anything, to be honest. I mean, I just binge watched uh, through the final season of Atlanta for, for today. Amazing show. I haven't seen that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's on Disney Plus. It's um written and directed by uh, Donald Glover, who majority of people might know as a childish Gambino. Brilliant show. Yeah. Fair enough. All right, check that out. Um, yeah, no, not really much on my end. Uh, wrapped up my final booking for the year. Yeah. Rumble Wrestling TV tapings, big edits coming. Looking forward to releasing that, seeing what people think. Uh, other than that. Just chilling out, really, trying to sort of, you know, make ends meet. Obviously, everyone's poor, aren't they, after Christmas? Fingers yep. crossed I might be uh, getting closer to having a car as well tomorrow. Yay. So, um, But, yeah, not really much else to talk about, really. Uh, we do have the end of year awards dropping for the mainstream wrestling, ladies and gentlemen. And we will, in very short due course, be recording an end of year awards special for the British independent scene. And as a very special bonus, the Wrestle Plug Stupid Awards End of Year Awards Ceremony will also be uh, recorded and available soon, where myself, hopefully Tanvir, Cameron Anderson, whoever's available, we will be doing an End of Year Awards for the stupidest wrestling awards you can possibly think of. Something more amusing to lighten your day. So look out for that. Not to mention a shit ton of watch longs have been recorded. We're looking forward to throwing a lot of those out there. Uh, loads of content coming and a couple of interviews have been sneaked in as well so a really good time to give the youtube channel a sub make sure you get involved and if nothing else make sure you share the content let everyone know that wrestle it may not be for everyone but it is mm -hmm. very uncensored very unfiltered and the most honest wrestling podcast available on this platform i truly believe that and i stand by that there's nothing wrong with what everyone else does, but we want to do something organic and authentic, and we don't want anyone to miss out on all the fucking crazy bullshit that we talk about. So if you do enjoy it, make sure you share it. If you think, yeah, this is two funny minorities on a state of wrestling address talking about shit and doing Vince McMahon impressions and talking about raping corpses. Good shit, pal. Good shit, pal. Um, so yeah, if you if you like that sort of thing for some unholy reason, let your friends know. But from myself, Aaron Nix, from, from Tam Viv Verdi, thank you very much for watching the State of Minority Dress, and we will catch you very soon for more brown content from the Wrestle Club.
Ooh. You're not supposed to salute. Stop that. <clears throat> Carl Wilkinson's not available. No saluting for you. Get out. He's too busy at Pussy Lake. Yeah, <laughs> fucking drowning in it. Yeah, in the wrong way. Put that man on the side of a milk cart and he's already disappeared. 